Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, super, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Everybody, it's been a long summer break, but we're back here in the Hungaro ring just outside Budapest, ready for the sixth round of the 2012 International GT Open season. And this is a very special weekend for the GT Open. Tomorrow we celebrate the GT Open's 100th race. But for now, we have got 70 minutes of electrifying action to look forward to around the twists and the turns of the Hungaro ring. Here in the Contra Box, it's myself, Ben Evans, alongside me, sports car and GT racer Thomas Erdos. And uh, 
Tommy, it's very hot outside and very, very close from qualifying this morning. Certainly hot indeed. Good afternoon, everybody. Really great to be here in Hungary once again. Uh, different sort of uh, a position from my point of view, but it's, uh, it's great to see a grid full of cars and undoubtedly probably the best uh, grid for GT3 and GT2 cars, uh, I think, in Europe and arguably the whole world. It's an absolutely huge field here, and this the first visit for the International GT Open to the Hungaro ring, although in qualifying this morning it was all too familiar with the air. Of course, Ferrari 458 of Jimmy Bruni, Jim Maria Bruni, placing that car on pole position. He was in dominant form yesterday in testing, and he's really carried that through to qualifying. So Bruni, who comes into the, this weekend lying sixth in the championship, having had a couple of non-finishes along the way, he will be looking to convert this pole position into a race victory that the air, of course, Ferrari has looked very fine all weekend, as has the Corvette for Raphael Giamaria. Well, Giamaria's co-driver, Miguel Ramos, got the weekend off to a slightly inauspicious start, clattering into the barriers in testing on Thursday. But since then, Tommy, the, the Corvettes have looked absolutely superb this morning in qualifying. Oh, without doubt, the Corvettes look absolutely stunning around the track. Great looking car as well. And uh, those guys are doing a good job, especially, obviously, Giamaria doing a great job. Uh, with the car in qualifying. No real surprises seeing a Bruni on pole with a Ferrari. Uh, obviously, uh, Bruni very experienced, got a lot of pace. And, uh, you know, of course, the A, of course, Ferrari very, very well prepared and very quick around the Hungara ring. Another very well prepared and competitive car is this one, the Villois Racing Aston Martin of Alvaro Barber. The Aston Martin, which has got still an appeal hanging over its head for its victory at Paul Ricard back in July, but it has been hugely competitive all year and has really gone well at Hungary thus far, although they are worried about tyre degradation over the course of the race. Another driver who was smiling but a little bit ruefully after qualifying was Andrea Montermini, who is lining up in fourth, but he just hasn't quite got the balance of that car right all weekend. And Montermini, though, so I mean, hugely experienced driver. He's raced in Formula One, he's raced in sports cars and GTs for many, many years. We'll see how he pushes up through the field. As we take a look then at the starting grid with Jimmy Bruni in pole position, Raphael Jim Rea alongside on the front row of the grid, Alvaro Barber and Andrea Montermini, row two. Philip Petter and the joint championship leading car of Marco Holzer comprise row three. The Porsche again really struggling with uh, tyre wear during testing, but Holzer and Tandy quietly confident of a good result. Daniel Zampieri, the first of the GTS cars, lines up in eighth position. Zampieri really has been the pace setter in that class this year, and just behind him, and in ninth is Stefano Pizzari. Disappointing qualifying for the Matlo Porsche team. Patrick Pile and Ram on the rack only line up in tenth position, and Lorenzo Bontempelli, well, he has got a long weekend ahead of him. He is a solo driver in 11th. Then we caught a glimpse of Cesar Ramos, the Brazilian debutant, in 12th. Archie Hamilton, the young British driver, looking to try and steal the GTS Championship if he can. He's got work to do, though, from... Then lower down the field, absolutely gigantic field of cars. 19th, Marcello Puglisi again. The Auto Orlando Sport Porsche with work to do. Well, if you're new to the National GT Open, this is how it works. We have two races each weekend, 70-minute and a 50-minute race. Today's race is the 70-minute race. Within that, all the teams must make a mandatory pit stop between 40% and 60% of the race distance. And most of the teams also have a driver change. The minimum pit stop time from pit entry to pit exit is 70 seconds. But then the way that the championship equalizes out performance between cars is that the car that wins the previous race gets 15 seconds added to its pit stop time. The car that comes second uh, gets 10 seconds. The car that's third, five seconds. And that is the same in both of the classes. And so that means that coming to today's race, Federico Leo and Jimmy Bruni, the pole sitting car, well, they've got an extra 25 seconds in the pits as opposed to the minimum pit stop time. So they are going to be looking to try and build up as much of a lead as possible. There are two classes in the National GT Open. There is the Super GT class, which is broadly speaking for GT2 cars, but they run to GT2 open regulations, which means the cars are a little bit different to the FA homologated GT2 cars. And then the GTS class, which again is based on the GT3 specification. The cars, Tommy, out on their formation lap around the Hungara ring. It's a circuit that you've raced on recently in prototypes, and the drivers, they're not going to get a rest this afternoon, are they? Absolutely not. This is a very physical circuit. Make no mistake, uh, driving one of these cars around here will be extremely physical. Uh, we're looking at uh, an after turn two. It really is just corner after corner after corner. Sector two is very important on this lap. 
and uh, the, the, the car and the drivers will take a big beating around here, there's no doubt about it. It's all about tyre management. Tyre degradation will be a key factor for sure in this race. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the pit stop, the, sorry, the penalties uh, for the, uh, the extended time in the pits. If you look at uh, the Ramos car, Gemaria Corvette, that looks actually in a very good position, but only five seconds added to its uh, pit, pit stop. So it'll be a, certainly one to look, look for in the race. A lot of the journalists in the media centre this morning were, were tipping the Corvette to come through and claim race victory, but we've got a lot of racing to go. This is the first visit of the International GT Open to the Hungara Ring, as we said earlier on. So a little bit of a voyage of discovery for these cars as they, as ever, form up for the rolling start. And it is going to be spectacular as they surge down towards Turn 1 for the first time. So it is the bright red Ferrari, number four, Jimmy Bruni, on the, the inside of the front row, alongside him, the black Vodafone back to number 17, Corvette of Raphael Giambria. Then we have got the all-black Aston Martin of Alvaro Barber. Let's see how we go as the race gets underway and they charge down towards turn one. And it's a good start from the Aston Martin of Alvaro Barber. And he launches through. They're three wide for the lead as they come into the first corner. And Barber launches around the outside. Will he squeeze through? No, he won't. Jimmy Bruni just holds on to that pole position advantage. But what a start from the Aston Martin. And assertive driving as well for Jim Rear in the Corvette. He climbs back up into second position then. Barber settles for third. Fourth place is the white Ferrari of Andrea Montermi as the rest of the pack cleanly to go down through turn two on towards turn three Patrick Pile pushed down over the curves here in the MacBook Porsche as accelerating on towards turn four it's Bruni then who leads it from Jim Rea Barber not only then the yellow Ferrari of Philip Petter and just behind him the Mantine Porsche of Marco Holzer that is the yellow and green car well, if you talk about the power of the Aston Martin all weekend, and what a start that was from Alvaro Barber, but then Jimmy Bruni, Tommy, can see why his next Formula 1 driver very bold through the first couple of turns. Without a doubt, you can see Bruni now extending a gap around a real professional style there, controlling the first corner, which was very important. A little slight lock-up into turn two for Bruni, but he actually managed to control that, and now he's pulling away. He now needs to look after his tyres, though. If he pushes too hard, those tyres will go off on him. We just called the glimpse there of the Maserati of Alessandro Pierre Guidi, who is a newcomer to the championship this weekend. The Maserati, an immaculately turned out car, as Olza looks to challenge Philip Petter. And there is the leading GTS car of Daniel Zampieri. He's got Lorenzo Bontempelli in the blue number 60 car, the blue and white car, the Opera Racing car, right up in Tisdale. So GTS cars as well, having a very close battle for position in the early stages as coming through to complete the first lap out of this never ending. Turn 14 and the long start and finish race. Here's Jim Abrini who leads it by 1.4 seconds from Rafael Giambri. And then we've got Alvaro Barber in third. Andrea Montermini is in fourth position. Then Philip Petter going behind him. And Sam Pieri is already giving some grief to Marco Holzer as we get a bid for position further back. It's one of the Auto Orlando Sport Porsches. And it's Archie Hamilton who gains the place of the Maserati. And that's a really nice move from Archie, the grandson of Le Mans winner Duncan Hamilton because the road drops away very steeply into turn one, Tommy, and you, you've got to really judge your braking point. Yeah, it's a very easy corner to lock up there, the brake, especially at the beginning of the race. You know, the, the drivers are a little bit tense. Uh, people are just getting settled at this stage. Obviously, a little bit of a gap now beginning to uh, appear between the cars, so I think the drivers are now just getting to their own rhythm and, uh, you know, keep the laps together. Again, looking after those tyres, a very important thing to uh, you know, this one. Yes, it's... Uh, in GT terms, not the longest race, 70 minutes, but it's, it's a long, long way around this Hungara ring circuit. You've been saying earlier on, it's a very busy lap. The drivers uh, are always working, and there's nothing to be gained by pushing too hard in the early stages for the loss of points later on, as that's very, very tight. Trying to gain the place is Patrick Pilet, Cesar Ramos, the Brazilian, who he was trying to squeeze past. We've also got a battle now, shaping up for third position. Alvaro Barber being chased down by Andrea Montermini, and then Philip Petter, not too far back either. He is in the black and yellow Kessel Racing Ferrari. And with the exception of the race leader, Jimmy Bruni, Tommy, the, the rest of the field still running very, very closely together. Yes, that's right. Uh, again, Bruni really uh, has done a very, very good job in terms of uh, pulling out of the, uh, the pursuing cars. And now, hopefully, he'll be looking after his tyres and doing some consistent lapping. Uh, really impressed with the uh, uh, there in third place and uh, again probably looking at the uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you know the tires beginning to get tired as well uh, you know i'll give it another four or five laps and uh, the heat inside these cars is pretty intense so uh, they need to kind of settle down to a nice rhythm and uh, but yeah it's looking like everyone's had a clean start no major
major incidents at this stage. So here's the race leader, Jimmy Bruni, into turn two. And Raphael Jim Rip is at Hasley. He's just set the fastest lap of the race, so he is bringing back down the race leader's advantage by a tenth of a second on that last lap. It's 1.3 seconds. Now, this is what Marco Holzer really didn't want, which is Daniel Zampieri all over his tail. You can see them in the back of the shot there. It's the really yellow Porsche leading the referee. Now, they're not racing for class position here. And Holzer, well, well this... As Bontepelli runs very wide, this is what you're talking about, Tommy, the long ball. Marco Holzer just wants to get his head down, run laps to a particular pace. He doesn't want to be engaged in the battle with Zampieri. No, absolutely not. Yeah, his, his, his concern really should be in absolutely lapping as consistently as possible and looking after the tyres all the way through. This is a real key point. In this heat, 35 degrees track temperature, that's going to have a toll. There's no doubt about that. All the cars in the championship, of course, run on a specification Dunlop control tyre. It's all the same compound for all the cars. And... As a result, it really is a challenge for the teams to find out how to best use those tyres over the course of the race duration. It's given us some, some very entertaining racing over the course of the season. As there is the intervention of Ellie, he is being chased down by Dear Derek Shittoff. And then we've got Michele Ruglo and Stefano Pizzari with still Patrick Pile is engaged in battle here with Cesar Ramos. And this is very impressive from Cesar because his background, the young Brazilian, has been in single seats as the World Series by Renault. And he's a relative novice for GG racing to be up there mixing with something of Pile's experience is very impressive. Very encouraging uh, debut for Cesar. He's doing very, very well. And uh, we'll see how he goes towards the latter stages of the race. Uh, obviously, there's no doubt he's got speed. He's proven that. Uh, but obviously, the GT racing is all about controlling the, uh, the pace of the car. Although you'll be pretty flat out, you still have to maintain tire line and yourself within the cockpit so you're not burning yourself out uh, too soon and that would appear to be what jimmy bruni's doing at the moment but he has just put in the fastest lap of the race he extends his advantage back over Rafa jim rear and is jim rear being caught here by alvaro barber i think he is barber a little bit quicker not so around two tenths of a second faster so the gap from second to third is coming back down and alvaro barber is bringing andrea montermini there in the white the law of course ferrari four five eight with him for company Andrea Monterm, he's mentioned earlier on, a former Formula 1 racer and former Ferrari Formula 1 test driver, hugely experienced driver. And Montermini is also, as with Jimmy Bruni, a thinking driver. He will be thinking the long game for this race, but he'll be heartened to be running in this company in the early stages. Then we've got this battle between Philip Petter and Marco Holzer. Again, Philip, vastly experienced competitor in the International GT Open, the former GTS champion with his co-driver Michael Brosnitsky. Just behind him, the Porsche works driver, Marco Holzer. And Holzer, Tommy, the life of a professional driver, he's been shuffling back and forth to America throughout the summer to compete in races over there for Porsche, and he's racing now for the next four weekends. Yes. Well, you know, he's, uh, he's already a young lad, and uh, that's what he should be doing. You know, showing his, uh, his skill uh, anywhere that he can, and uh, he's doing a great job. He wasn't particularly happy with the uh, setup of the car in qualifying, and uh, he actually said he did a very good lap, but uh, I think they're struggling a little bit with, uh, with a bit of pace, a bit of lack of pace, and perhaps straight line speed. But uh, yeah, he's uh, holding on station in sixth place, and uh, you never know. We'll see what happens to his latter end of the age. Of the race. Just saw a glimpse there of Patrick Pile moving back ahead of Cesar Ramos as their battle continues. Rafael Jim Rear, the ex Formula 3000 racer, circulating in second position. Jim Rear stalwart competitor in the international GT Open. He was fourth in last year's championship, third the year before. And this year, though, they've had a, he and Miguel Ramos had a troubled season making the switch mid-year from the Ferrari 458 to the Chevrolet Corvette, but it's, it's really worked out for them. And Jim Rear and Ramos seem much more comfortable with the Corvette and have immediately held themselves up into race-winning contention. You can see now the lap times, uh, both from Gianmaria, Raffaele and Barber, they're now sort of getting towards the lap times that Bruni is setting. Uh, but obviously Bruni set that at the very beginning of the race and he was able to pull a gap. And he's now clearly controlling that pace, Bruni, so doing a, a, an ultra-professional ultra job. And uh, although the others, as I said, is keep, they're keeping up now with the pace, they, they've got that gap behind to make up. So Bruni very much in control of the race at this stage. Philip Petra and Marco Holzer just beginning to engage themselves in battle. Hand over at mid-race to Michael Rosnitsky. Marco Holzer passes the keys to the very rapid Nick Tandy and the Manti Racing Sport who prepare that Porsche. Always an immaculately turned down car. They, they always think about where they want that car to be at the check of flag and race accordingly to it. What that means is they if they need Marco to roll up his sleeves, get his elbow out and try and find a way past Philip Petter, that's exactly what he'll do. And at the 
the moment it seems maybe as if that Ferrari Tommy is just holding up the Porsche. Yes, absolutely. I think they definitely have the Porsche at the moment. Uh, a little bit, uh, you know, perhaps, uh, again, time management going on. It's, I mean, I keep saying that it's such an important part of the race here at the Hungara Ring. This is a very, very hard track. As I said, you know, as you come out of turn one, you're, just, you're cornering all the way through. And, uh, and the drivers really have to do it. Uh, as, as well as push it as hard as they can to have the management on the tyres throughout the race. And that will become clearer, that picture will become clearer towards the end of the race, who's got any tyres left at the end. Which means that's exactly what Bill Royce Racing didn't want, which is Alvaro Barber snatching the brakes, going into turn two, running a little bit wide, and it's brought him right into the clutches of Andrea Montermini. Montermini is in a position to bounce here and move up ahead of him. Both of these cars won that poor Ricard last time out on the road. Tiesto Marks have won the long Saturday race on Termini and Juan Manuel Lopez who claims sports on Sunday have both results are pending an appeal that will be held next week but for now they've got the points and they've got the result from Paul Ricard where despite that cloud hangover, over both cars were in, in very fine form as were all the drivers on Termini though really able to close up through these twists and turns behind Alvaro Barbara are we going to see a bid here from Andrea Montermini now possibly out of this right hander towards the latter section of the lap you can just about force your way through there if you can carry the momentum but the problem that Montermini has got here Tommy this is multi-mark GT racing and the Aston Martin is incredibly fast through a straight line so no matter how much Montermini closes up through the corners he's really got the task to then try and propel himself past on the straight absolutely no doubt the Aston Martin has the advantage on the straight line that's clear to see you can see on the uh, on the screens uh, but the, uh, the Ferrari has the edge uh, I think on the handling after its tyres better than the, uh, the Aston. The Aston might be able to suffer a little bit with the left front, obviously being a front engine car. Uh, it will actually uh, have to look after that um, a little bit later. And of course, Bruni is setting a very quick time at the front, and these guys don't want to drop back too much, so that's pushing them as well. It really is, but this is the battle of the race at the moment for third position. It's still Jimmy Bruni who leads it. Second place, Rafael Giamri. Then we've got this fight between Alvaro Barber and Andrea Montermini, Montermini asking questions into turn two. Already trying to find a way through on the inside line. And Alvaro Barber, he's missed the apex on a lot of the, the last lap, Tommy. And again, he was looking a little bit ragged through turns two and three. I just wonder if the team might get on the radio and say, look, don't fight this too much with Montermini. Let him through if it means that you can be a bit smoother. Oh, well, you can, you know, that's the call that you don't want to get. As a driver, uh, it's difficult to back off, but Barber has to be clever about this. He needs to look after his tyres. Of course, Montemini is putting an awful lot of pressure on him, but, you know, at this stage of the race, he needs to keep it clean, keep it from walking up, and uh, just look to the end of the race. It's a long, long time as well until the pit window opens, which might break up this battle. That opens with 42 minutes remaining in the race, so they have got an awful lot of action up ahead of them. Marco Holzer has still got Daniel Zampieri for companies. Here come the race leaders. Then this fight for third position. And Alvaro Barber will be very relieved for this momentary respite along this short back straight from turn 11 into turn 12. Then they've got the two looping hairpins of 13 and 14 to bring what will be the seventh lap of a race to a close. So the AF course Ferrari of Jimmy Bruni leads the way. This, though, is a very good job in second position from Jim Reid. Stay with him. And again, running wide, Alvaro Barber through turn 14. And he's not made friends with the apex at all over this last lap. And Montermini may have just got a little bit of a better run out of turn 14. A long start to finish straight. And they come into the braking zone for turn one. Anxious spectating on the one pit wall. There's no doubt Montermini has a lot more pace than Barber. The previous lap, Montermini did a 48-1 matched uh, Bruni's, uh, John Maria Bruni's lap time. So he clearly has a lot more pace than Barber. And at this stage, really, Montemini needs to get through. So, you know, because he's losing time now. He needs to get through Barber as cleanly as possible and start moving towards the front. Well, that's what we'd like to do. He can see that a very similar Ferrari 4 for 8, that of Jimmy Bruni, is leading the way. And he's only five seconds up the road at the moment. So there's plenty of opportunity if Montemini can get through to bring those gaps back down, certainly to Raphael Gia Maria. Well, though this fight for third is some way clear of the fifth place car that remains Philip Petter. Mauro Barber turning through this very technical second section of the circuit and Montermi is just looming in his mirrors and that Ferrari 4 8 looks so aggressive he looks to the inside line but he can't quite find a way through and if you were in the cockpit of that Ferrari now Tommy where would you be looking to try and make that 
pass. Well, he was absolutely right to show his nose there, but obviously, and also right to back off. There wasn't quite enough room there. But clearly, that's where he has the advantage on the Aston. He's through sector two, and he has to really just find his way through as quickly as possible, but obviously not risk the car. So, Andorra is doing the right thing, but it is, it is difficult. You know, the Aston's got a lot of straight line speed. And we're about to see that amply demonstrated as they work through turns 13 and 14 once more. We have some action lower down the field, and it is the Maserati drawing alongside and going past Archie Hamilton into turn 12. And that's an honestly judged move as the leaders ready down towards turn one. And Monterm is very, very close to Alvaro Barber and Barber. A little bit tentative on the brakes. Marco Holzer and Daniel Zampieri. Zampieri still leads the GTS class from that man, the blue car. Lorenzo Bontempelli as Montermini draws alongside Barber. He's going to try around the outside to turn two. And that's very brave from Montermini. Then looks for the switch back. Now on the exit of turn two towards turn three. But Barber demonstrates just how wide an Aston Martin can be if you need it. But now as they come towards turn four, this next sequence of seven or so corners, Tommy, is where the Ferrari's been so strong. You can tell just by looking at the body language of the Ferrari. It is hungry to get through. It really wants to get through. Andrea now needs to really... You know, use all his uh, his, his uh, experience to get through cleanly. Now, this is going to be difficult, but this is the se this is the sector that he needs to do it in. Uh, so hooking his car over the curbs, Alvaro Barber pushing very hard as we have more action a little bit lower down the field. That's Lars Dugamo going around the outside of a rotating Miguel Amaral. So Amaral spinning around. He should recover from there. It's not coming into contact with any of the scenery. So here are the race leaders. Jim Rear is still keeping Jimmy Bruni very, very honest. Now we've got this fight for third and fourth, which is still so tight around the circuit. It's going to have been another lap of frustration, I fear, for Andrea Montermini. There was no way through at turn 12 into turn 13. They come then the long left-hand hairpin, then the right-hand hairpin. Turn 14 brings them towards the latter stages and the end of the lap. He's driving, he's using experience, and this isn't too too defensive a, a drive from Barber at the moment. He's, he's sticking to the next line, he's not going offline and slowing himself up too much. No, Barber is using his car very wisely. He knows he has the straight line advantage, and as long as, as, long as he gets on a straight ahead of uh, Montemini, there's no way that the Ferrari will get past. Now, this is where it gets tricky for Barber. Exactly, because Philip Petter is circulating a little bit more quickly than the pair of them as well as again Montoni looks the inside of Alvaro Barber and he's right up onto the tail of the Aston Martin but then Barber is able to plant his right foot pulls away a little bit from the Ferrari as they sprint out to turn three on towards the quick left-hander at turn four one of the most exciting things on the circuit and Alvaro Barber setting the race best pace through the speed trap last time round as well 238.9 now, but well, there's plenty to smile about in the air, of course, Garage, because their man, Jimmy Bruni, is up ahead of this fight on the road. So through six and seven they come, and on to the left-hander at turn eight. And both drivers using the abundance of curve. They really are pushing very, very hard. As again, Bruni tries to get that exit out of turn nine, accelerating along towards turns, turn 12 race leading duo then we have the point for third which is on this lap probably been won really by Alvaro Barber he's been able to pull out a car length or so over Montermini we're still 10 minutes away from the opening of the pit window and what we haven't really talked about here although you mentioned it we're at the top of the broadcast Tommy is that Jimmy Bruni is looking at 20 seconds more in the pits than Raphael Jim Rear and Jim Rear is staying within two seconds of Bruni Absolutely, and you can see the lap times. Last lap time for Jamaria, um, Rafael Jamaria was two tenths actually faster than Bruni. So that Corvette is sitting in a very nice place at this stage. Obviously, putting a lot of pressure on Miguel Ramos in the pits. He's watching the screens, and uh, he needs to get that Corvette out. And uh, you know, I think he will have a, a good chance of leading the race at some point. Well, here is the leader of the GTS race. That is Daniel Zampieri in the Kessel Racing prepared Ferrari 4 of 8 Zampieri has, for my money, been one of the most exciting drivers in the championship this year, and that's why sliding the Ferrari into turn two on the brakes, he only knows one way to drive, and that is head down and charging, but it has yielded some very fine results over the course of the 2012 season already, and really, for a car that, that strictly speaking, according to regulations, you'd expect to be a second or so.
so slower than the Super GT cars are standing right up there with Marco Holzer, a multiple race winner this season. Well, Zampier is uh, absolutely showing his skills there and uh, obviously throughout the season is uh, really uh, driven very, very well. Uh, he will have, though, in this circuit, if I keep beating on the same subject, he will have to look after those tyres. Too much of that slide, although it looks good, he will do the tyres no good. Well, it's certainly spectacular to watch, and I'm sure that Daniel Zampieri is thoroughly enjoying himself as well behind the wheel, as is Jimmy Bruni. That's a lovely shot through the window. You can see him working the wheel. The team watch on in the garage, and I think they will be starting to get a little bit concerned here, Tommy, because Jimmy is not dropping GM Rear in the Corvette at all, and almost that gap is staying stable more because Rafael GM Rear wants it to, rather than because Jimmy Bruni is able to pull away from him. Uh, exactly. I, I think I'm sure they would have preferred to have seen a bigger gap between the Ferrari and the Corvette, but that's not happening. Of course, the Corvette has very good pace and uh, very well driven at both cars. And all the while, though, they are pulling some way clear of this fight for third position, which is just backing itself up towards Philip Petra as well. So, still Alvaro Barber in third, Andrea Montermini in fourth, and Montermini closing that gap back down over the course of the last lap. And this fight has now been the ongoing for the best part of 15 minutes. Certainly trying to force the error from Alvaro Barber, but Barber is having none of that in the Aston Martin. Really two race victories to his credit this year, Alvaro Barber. He's going to have to work very hard to get to the podium this afternoon. Wiggles the car coming out of turn four into turn five. And they can't it's just a little bit of a smoother lap from Alvaro Barber as we dip back into the GTS fight ongoing. The Mercedes very well conditioned championship this weekend. Gianluca De Lorenzi currently at the wheel of that car in seven. And he has got Marcello Puglisi right up on his tail. So a nice battle going as well between Cesar Ramos and Alessandro Pierre Guidi in the Maserati and the pair of them both up behind Michele Brugolo. Also got the two Ferraris and the Maserati fighting for GTS Ons. That is the fight for 12th, 13th and 14th position. Brugolo currently is the head of that train. Then Cesar Ramos, then the immaculately prepared Maserati. Really spectacular looking car that and has been attracting a lot of onlookers from the Hungarian crowd in the garage this morning. He looks to the inside. Says Ramos, but he can't quite squeeze through all these drivers, Tommy. Finding in these early stages that overtaking is a real challenge. It is, yes. Good, good showing, I have to say, from the Maserati MC3. Uh, they're, they're viewing here at the Hungara Ring. It's a brand new car, and they're showing very, very well, you know, in, in this first race. So, uh, very encouraged to see a car they're viewing in, in competitive straight away. Still, the fight for third position remains as it was ever thus. Although, again, Alvaro Barber. Running a little bit offline through turn two. Montoni tries to show his nose to the inside of the Martin. He can't quite do it. And have this short sprint towards turn four. That's the opportunity for the Aston Martin to buy itself a couple of car lengths over the crest of turn four. And Philip Petter is definitely closing up. And in fact, Petter last time round was a second faster than Andrea Montoni. He's brought that gap down from fourth to fifth. Just one and a half seconds. There is the Kessel Racing Ferrari looming very large in the background and soon this is going to be a three-way fight between the Aston Martin and then the two Ferrari 458s and for Andrea Montoni this is now the moment Tommy where he really needs if he can to try and make that move rather than get embroiled in a multi-car dice. Yes I think uh, to be honest uh, it would have been nice if it happened a few laps ago from Montevini's uh, position obviously he's very frustrated now behind the wheel you can see the back end of the car sliding now coming out of the uh, the right-hander uh, he's trying his best, obviously, but uh, the uh, barber just has the answer at the moment. And, of course, Montemini now will have uh, Peter in his mirrors, uh, which will add to the pressure. Certainly will. So it's still, though, the black Vilwa racing Aston Martin of Alvaro Barber that leads the white for the course Ferrari of Andrea Montemini in this fight for third position. The race is still, of course, led by the Air Force Ferrari of Jimmy Brunny. Second place is Rafael Giamria in the Corvette. Then we've got this fight third, and then Philip Petter looming large in fifth position as they come in to the start of another lap. Showing himself in the mirrors of Alvaro Barber is Andrea Montermini, which they no way through into turn one for Montermini. 
particularly this stage of the race. We have got 45 minutes remaining, but more importantly, though, we are beginning to come towards the start of the pit window. Whether or not we'll see cars more into the pits early on will be something to watch for as we get this battle. Still for 13th position down in turn one, saves Ramos, though. Holding his alone around the outside, looks the Maserati. He tries to power right the way around the outside of the Ferrari. He couldn't quite do it. Robust defensive driving from Cesar Ramos into turn two. Ramos needs to get this spot on. He times his braking perfectly, and so there's no way through for Alessandro Pierre Guidi, despite the Italian driver's very best efforts as they plunge out of turn three, flashing his lights. I think that's more an optimism than expectation, because at the moment Ramos is showing that he can stick to his line and make that Ferrari very wide indeed. Well, with Maserati again impressing me a lot. It's uh, for the first race uh, for that car in, comp in real competition. It's obviously get the, has the pace of the GTS Ferrari. And um, it's a shame on that breaking for turn one, if Maserati had cut in on the inside, it could have maybe had outrun the Ferrari into turn two. But uh, uh, nevertheless, doing a great job there behind the Ferrari. And uh, looking not too bad around the corners either. So it isn't just grunt. It's actually, you know, working very well around the back. It really is, and this is the beauty of the International GT Open, is you've got this multi-mark GT racing everywhere you look. Uh, there's different marks of car racing wheel to wheel, and so the Maserati making its debut this weekend in the International GT Open for the 2012 season. Right up there with Cesar Ramos. Ramos again hugging the inside of the curbs at turn 13, and on towards turn 14 as we have look at more adventures further back and that Tommy was the move you were talking about a moment ago the cut back up the inside from Gianluca De Lorenzi in the Mercedes precisely that's what I was hoping looking at that move earlier that, that uh, the Maserati uh, maybe adopted that line but there you go maybe he can learn from that that said we did see one of the support races earlier on today that move went very wrong resulting in quite a few damaged cars and so the drivers are there watching that in the garage before this race got underway they may have been bearing that in mind so still in second position, this car, the Chevrolet Corvette, Raphael A. Jim Rear chasing down the race leader, Jimmy Rudy. In there, of course, Ferrari. I've been so impressed by Jim Rear's drive in, in this first phase of the race, Tommy, because that Corvette is not an easy car to pilot around the circuit like the Hungaro ring. No, it is, uh, well, it looks like a big, heavy car, but obviously it's very effective. I mean, let's not forget, this is uh, basically a GT1 car, obviously, um, brought down to specification for GT2. Uh, so it's a very capable car, but um, you would think, of course, the Ferrari looks like a more nimble car, especially around the bends here at the Hungarian Ring. Doing a great job here. If you look at the lap times of the uh, Corvette, very, very impressive, very consistent. Still this fight for 12, 13 and 14 place rages because every time that Cesar Ramos isn't coming under attack from the Maserati, he immediately brings himself back onto terms with Michele Rugolo in 12th. through turns 10 and 11 then along this short back straight where you can just about find your way past if you're able to get a really good exit from turn 11 and your rival maybe hooks wheel over the curb but no such mistake for hours but then Rugolo pulling out very wide through turn 13 and that feels like a problem for Michele Rugolo or is it because he doesn't go into the pits and so he, he may be struggling for the gear selection at the same time very strange to have lost all that drive and then go past the pits not not head in to get that checked out no, absolutely that looked like some kind of gearbox uh, issue perhaps missed the gear uh, which i find it difficult with the fellowship gearboxes but uh, you know sometimes they go wrong as well so that looked like a clear case of uh, not engaging the right gear but his uh, hope looks to be going again so this now frees up says ramos to try and make good his escape from alessandro pierre guidi in the Maserati. The pit window, meanwhile, is open, so the driver changes can take place where they're required, but not in the number six car, Lorenzo Montempelli, his regular driving partner, Mario Cordoni, not here this weekend. So Lorenzo is going through the whole race distance, but he's going to have to make another pit stop. A drive through penalty has been awarded to Montempelli for exceeding the track limits once too often. We've seen this a lot during testing and qualifying, Tommy, that with the concrete one of runoff areas that we've got for the Formula One cars that race here, it is very tempting to run wide. As we see, the first of the changes is Stefano Gattuso, last year's reigning GTS champion, who takes over from Marco Zutini. And this car 
we can expect to lie now in the hands of Gattuso. Yes, Gattuso is a very, very quick guy, and uh, uh, there's no doubt he'll be making some, some places. Uh, and we're back again with this battle uh, with Sazo and the Maserati. Let's not forget, this is now a battle for, no, it's not quite the problem, it's for the fifth place in GTS. And uh, uh, for those, both of those guys, in terms of Sazo as the... Uh, you know, the rookie into the first race and the Maserati is the rookie car, they are now knocking on the step of the podium. So, uh, very impressive performance from both of these guys. However, as a new car to the championship this weekend, the Maserati in this race has an additional 15 seconds in the main parish. Cesar Ramos just has that minimum 70 seconds. So, coming into the bit late now is Diego Richardon. circuit very physical it's very hot uh, temperatures now inside the cockpit these guys have done an awful lot of laps and uh, you know to maintain this level of concentration and consistency through the lapping uh, it takes uh, you know takes some skill so uh, again a great job by the Aston man and uh, Montemio doing what he can you know but uh, yeah he's finding it hard to find a way through um, and right now it looks like they're gonna pit uh, as they stand now another lap completed and another lap without them going in but Barber slides in the rear of that car and he runs very very wide through the final turn now is this going to be Montermini's opportunity the race leaders also continue on their way so it's still Jimmy Bruni leading it from Raphael Jim rear and then we've got Alvaro Barber he's going to have to use all of the horsepower of the Aston Martin he is able to just pull away from Andrea Montermini as they arrive into the braking zone for turn one so be very careful to get the car stopped in time he's able to that ball on turn he closes up on him into turn two are we going to see similar effect again on turn he just more confident on the brakes brings that gap back down to about half a car length Alvaro Barber almost seems to exit turn to a walking pace in comparison to the Ferrari but then he's able to use really the Aston Martin strong statue in straight line speed out of turn three on towards turn four Montermini's going to do all that work again to bring that gap back down Again, we're terminally doing everything again, but Barber is just able to carry just that much speed to be able to use the power that he has available to him. And uh, again, uh, not putting a foot wrong. Nearly lost the back end of the car there into the last turn onto the pit straight, but managed to get it together and use the horsepower down the straight. So, uh, well, uh, not many laps away now from these guys coming into the pits. Well, they're coming towards the end of the lap again, and as a driver, Tommy, does it occasionally psychologically affect you? If you make a mistake in the corner on the previous lap, do you think, I've got to be more careful? 
careful here next time round and will you be a little bit slower as a result? Well, absolutely. You try, you try to sort of focus even more and, and be clean and obviously try and make up that lost time that you had if you had a moment, whatever it was. The last thing you want to do is overdrive and have more problems, more slides. So Barba is showing a very mature drive at this stage. Rafael Rear. There he is in second position in the Chevrolet Corvette. And he's staying right with Jimmy Brilli. They're still separated by just 1.6 seconds. And again, Jim Rear faster on that last lap by the best part of half a second. And those smiles that we saw on there, of course, Garage earlier on the team who prepare the car of Andre Montevi is here comes the fight into the pits. They come together, would you believe? So it's going to be Alvaro Barba. He hands over to Matteo Malicelli, whereas Andrea Montermini, it's Juan Manuel Lopez, Cachito Lopez, who takes over Cockpit Lopez, who was fifth in last year's International GT Open season with four wins to his credit. Matteo Malicelli, a former Italian GT champion, so they're both experienced drivers. Teams just taking the pressures on the tyres. No moves to change those tyres just yet. That seems to be a very controlled and relaxed pit stop. The race leaders, though, yet to make their stop as we are just over half race distance. 34 and a half minutes remaining, and it is still this car, number four, Giria Bruni, who leads the way in the AF Course Ferrari. Second place remains number 17, Rafael Giria in the Chevrolet Corvette. Those pit stops from most up into third place now. The Kessel Racing. Ferrari 458 with Philip Petter and climbing to fourth, the Manti Racing Porsche of Marco Holzer. But will we see the race leaders appealing into the pits this time around? Also still waiting to see who emerges from the pits, first of all, in that fight that we were seeing for third position. And Tommy may have got a view of that. Yes, uh, Bam, we can see outside the uh, commentary window here, the, uh, the barber, or, well, the Aston Martin got ahead of the Ferrari uh, out of the pits. It did, so they leave the pits pretty much exactly as they arrived, and almost exactly a lap down on the leading duo who are still yet to make their pit stops. And it's no surprise there, really, because Jimmy Bruni passes over to Federico Leo, last year's FAA European GT3 champion, Miguel Ramos, this, who takes over from Rafael Giamaria. But Jimmy Bruni, it's a long pit stop for Bruni, 25 seconds on top of the 17 that have to spend in the pits, whereas it's just five seconds on top of the 17 that Jimmy wants to spend in the pits. So now Juan Manuel Lopez tries to get onto the tail of Matteo Malicelli, and this will be a, a very impressive drive from Lopez if he's able to stay with Malicelli. Malicelli has been really formidable through the opening five rounds of the season. Lopez, though, mentioned the multiple race winner and he slides the front he's pushing very hard Lopez on his outlap as much as anything the last thing he wants to do now Tommy is get tangled up being lapped by the race leaders even though it's slightly artificial because of the, the pit stop lengths they don't want Jimmy Bruni on their tail trying to get through whilst they're busy fighting for thirds yeah, absolutely obviously we'll take now a couple of laps for these uh, for the new drivers and second drivers to find their rhythm and uh, push as hard as they can without uh, making mistakes just like it did the uh, opening drivers in the, in the start of the race so uh, uh, a couple of laps before we actually get a good feel for what the second part of the race is going to feel like are we going to see either of the leading duo into the pits this time around no we're not so another lap to be reeled off by the race leaders and Bruni and Jim Reel they'll, they'll be in constant contact on the radio with the pit wall won't they Tommy just finding out where they are in the race waiting for that call to come in uh, and really just doing what they do which is get their head down and drive each lap as consistently and as rapidly as possible yes of course they're in radio communication with their their pit members and uh, race engineers they will be telling them uh, what the others are doing as well and obviously maximize the, uh, the their time on track so that they end up with a maximum advantage now very impressive lap times again from Gemma Maria Raphael uh, with the Corvettes uh, still doing very low 48s uh, on tyres they have done an awful lot of work so uh, clearly the Corvette working the Dunlops very very well indeed into the pits then and the third position is Philip Petter that is to hand over to Michael Brosnitsky now this could be very interesting because that car hasn't got any additional pit penalty time which means it should emerge into third position out ahead of the of Matteo Malicelli, so Michael Brosnitsky has been put 
fill up the order in the early stages by Philip Petter, also into the pits. Stefano Pizzari hands over to Andrea Rizzoli in the GTS class, which is, despite his drive through penalty, still being led by Lorenzo Montepelli, but he has not made his full pit stop yet. We've also actually not seen Daniel Zampieri into the pits either, so Zampieri is still leader of the GTS class, but he has not made the pit stop. He needs to hand over to Michael Dallastella, who promotes Zampieri to third in the race overall for the moment. Also into the pits, past our contrary position, overlooking the pit lane is Marco Holzer, and that hands over to Nick Tandy. That pit stop has been completed. As into the pits now, comes Rafael Giamria, so Giamria into the pit lane, the second place car, blinks first. Jimmy Bruni continues on his way, Giamria rumbles down the pit lane. And that Corvette, it's a moving earthquake. We've been watching the action from the pit lane this morning, and you can't help but notice when the Chevrolet Corvette comes past you. Typical um, brute American V8 uh, rumble. It's, I remember driving one of them. It's a different car, but uh, with a similar engine. Very, very noisy indeed, but obviously very effective. A very fast car. And we've got a bit of a problem there. And smoking Bagley, Miguel Angel de Castro. Now, is that mechanical or is that a tyre rub? Can't quite see from that angle. Whatever it is, it's going to bring him into the pits at the end of this lap. So problems one of the cars that was already having a, a difficult race. Yeah, that to me almost looks like a suspension damage. It looks like the car is actually a little bit lower than it should be, and uh, to me that looks like tyre rev on the bodywork. Well, this is very interesting. Nick Tandy's emerged from the pits just ahead of Matteo Malicelli, and this is going to give us a super race in the latter stages. We'll see at the end of this lap on the timing screen whether Michael Brosnitsky has emerged ahead of this fight as well into third place. But Tandy and Malicelli, two hard chargers. And they've also got Juan Manuel Lopez not too far back either in the Ferrari, but it's the Porsche that leads the Aston Martin at the moment, despite the best efforts of Malicelli to try and fight his way through. And if Malicelli is able to keep his head here through turn 14, he will have a good run on the Porsche along the front straight into turn one. So to the final corner now, the long right-hand hairpin, turn 14, then on to the front straight, there will the Aston Martin be able to power past the Manti Racing Porsche, let's see, it's Tandy who leads through to complete lap, we just caught a glimpse there of Michael Brosnitsky, who has come up, essentially into third place in the race overall, into the breaking zone for turn one, Tandy tries to defend, but Malicelli is through, can he get the car stopped on time, he runs a little bit wide and Tandy goes back, he looks for the switchback, they run side by side in towards turn two, but it's the Aston Martin that's got the inside line, and again Tandy's going to pray dare with Malicelli on the brakes, he tries around the outside, that's a brilliant drive from Nick Tandy, Malicelli though holds his position and does make it through, he gains the place, so climbing into fourth is Matteo Malicelli, dropping to fifth, Nick Tandy, and Tandy gave as good as he could as the race leader is in Jimmy Bruni handing over to Federico Leo. But Tommy, that side-by-side -side action through turns one and two, that's what GT racing is all about. That was great, great action there, great driving by both drivers, and Tandy did all he did all he could really try around the outside. Uh, that was the right move because that would have put him on the inside of turn three. But unfortunately, he just didn't have enough grip on the outside of turn two. But uh, a brave fight from Tandy, but the Aston has the legs. So the pit window is at the conclusion with Jimmy Bruni, the last driver to come into the pits. And Malachelli and Tandy says on the screen it's battle for fifth. That's because we had Daniel Zampieri handy over to Michael Dallastella as they came over the line last time around. So we'll be able to give you the full rundown at the end of this lap which they are about to complete rumbling through has got Miguel Ramos so will Ramos be able to get up ahead of Federico Leo in the AF course Ferrari will find out in due course as we follow the Aston Martin through here comes the Ferrari so it is in to lead the race Miguel Ramos in the Corvette leads the race second place just is Federico Leo in the Ferrari 48 third place is the black and yellow Ferrari just saw into turn one there that is Michael Brosnitsky fourth place is Alvaro Barber here in the Veloz Racing not Alvaro Barber rather Matteo Malicelli in the Veloz Racing Aston Martin fifth place is Nick Tandy in car eight there is the 52 car of Freddie Kramer, who they are just putting a lap on. Freddie, who thoroughly enjoys his motor racing. Running a little bit low 
wide down the order so it's Ramos who leads the race and well will he be able to hold on to claim victory we'll see at the end of this lap his advantage but what is really going to help Miguel Ramos here Tommy is this battle between Federico Leo and Michael Brozanitsky because Leo and Brozanitsky very evenly matched cars there of course and Kessel Racing they prepare there of course of course preparing number four car Kessel Racing the number 11 car a lot of inter-team rivalry sense purposes there is very little to choose between the cars well, i think leo will have the legs on for, for this week. i mean once once he yeah he's already starting to pull away a little bit he should be able to pull away but uh, you know he's uh, well he's not i mean the yellow uh, car is getting near but uh, we'll see we'll see there's only 25 minutes to go now and uh, ramos if he puts his head down he, uh, he should be able to control this race we'll have to look closely now between uh, the uh, uh, Leo's uh, lap times and uh, Ramos to see uh, where things are going out a few laps. And this is where tyre management is going to be absolutely key because in the first half of the race, Jimmy Bruni had to push really quite hard, whereas Philip Petter was able to run his own pace and just wonder whether Michael Brosnitsky has inherited the car with its tyres in slightly better shape. So the advantage that Miguel Ramos has got over Federico Leo is 10.6 seconds as they came across the line. Here is Matteo Malicelli in fourth and Malicelli was three seconds faster than Michael Brozanitsky last time around and the gap between Malicelli and Brozanitsky is only 3.3 seconds so it could be just a, a matter of moments before Malicelli comes up onto the tail of Brozanitsky. Malicelli is also he's only 15 seconds back from the race leader Mingo Ramos and he was four seconds quicker than Ramos so this could be on would you believe for the Aston Martin to claim victory would be an astonishing drive Tommy but he might just have enough time well it clearly showed in the uh, earlier parts of the race that the, uh, the Aston has the pace to do it and uh, I was uh, questioning whether the car would uh, make the tyres last for the end of the, uh, his, uh, the first stint and obviously it did uh, doing some very good lap time so uh, we'll see what happens we're just catching some shots there of Daniel Roos another very very welcome newcomer to the championship this weekend in the Schubert Motorsport BMW Z4 and that car is immaculately prepared. The team have done an absolutely superb job and Daniel in qualifying for tomorrow's second race of the weekend put together a series of very, very impressive laps. He's currently in 17th position so he's got a bit of work to do to climb up through the order. I'm sure it will be equal to the challenge. That Z4, really very fine car he's running in the gts class which is currently being led by this car that's number 56 andrea rizzoli who leads the class in the air of course ferrari Rizzoli and bizzari who have had a very successful season they're currently running in seventh second in the class number 44 michael dallastelli he runs in ninth and it's massimo vantavani who is third in the gts class and he is tenth overall but he has got marco mapelli fourth in the class of the Orlando Sport Porsche homing on his tail ram on the rack we see just behind him in the Super GT class Porsche in eighth it's been a difficult weekend for the rack and Pile as Rizzoli well this Tommy is really where Rizzoli would just want to be an empty track and he's got just got a drive to his rhythm as leaping over the curves with Tim Malicelli he certainly believes the victory is on here. So here's the race leader, Miguel Ramos. His advantage on that last lap to Federico Leo came down by one and a half seconds. And so it's down to under 10 seconds, just eight and a half seconds from the race leader, Miguel Ramos, to the second place car of Federico Leo. And for Ramos, this is really very difficult. He's an experienced racer, but he would admit himself he's he's not a professional driver he is a gentleman driver yes Ramos uh, been you know he's, he's done a lot of racing uh, back uh, many years back doing Formula 3 so uh, an experienced single-seater driver and uh, obviously done a lot of GT racing as well um, we actually uh, shared a, t a team we were teammates uh, back in 2004 in the FA GT so you know uh, Miguel has been driving for many many years he's a very experienced driver uh, he knows exactly what's going on behind him the team will be telling that on the radio so uh, right now he needs to just uh, keep his head down not make mistakes and go as fast as he can obviously to try and maintain that gap so that last lap from Miguel Ramos was a 1 minute 
1.148 and that plays a 1 minute 48.6 from Federico Leo. He's bringing that gap down by another two and a half seconds. And have we got the change for third? We do up the inside into turn one. Matteo Malicelli moves ahead of Michael Brosnitsky. So Malicelli already into third position and he's only 11 seconds back from the race leader. This is very much on for Malicelli. The fastest car though on track at the moment is Federico Leo in second. But Malicelli, that last lap may be a slight anomaly because he was up by Michael Rosnitsky. So now he is once more unleashed into clear air in the Villa Aston Martin. Also, Nick Tandy is not too far back from Rosnitsky either, is he? So the Manta Racing Porsche climbs over the tail of the Kessel Racing Ferrari. And Tandy tried to squeeze up through on the inside line. He couldn't quite do it, but Tandy always drives with 100% commitment. And this battle is also bringing Juan Manuel Lopez into the mix as well. It's all hotting up, isn't it, towards the end? It'll be a fantastic end of the race. And uh, Ramos will have a mirror full of Ferrari soon. There's no doubt about it. Ferrari's uh, making up a lot of time on Ramos. Well, that was a fairly assertive chop across the bows of Nick Tandy from Michael Brosnitsky. Brosnitsky determined to maintain that fourth position as they head through turn 11 onto the short back straight. Turn 12 is no taking opportunity unless you're on wide like that, Nick Tandy. He will then try and force an error on the brakes from Brosnitsky into 12. While the white Ferrari number two, Juan Manuel Lopez, tries to pick his way past the Porsche. But it means that Malicelli has moved clear of this scrap. It's around turn 13. They come into the final turn of the lap. The race leader, Miguel Ramos, by the way, is through. And 1 minute 51.8 as opposed to 1 minute 48.7. So that gap is down to under three seconds now for first to second. But will we see a change for fourth as they arrive into turn one? It's going to be pretty bold on the brakes from everybody concerned. And Tandy has to move to the inside to cover the line from Juan Manuel Lopez. So they remain as they were. Still Michael Rosnitsky, the yellow black car is fourth. For the yellow car, Nick Tandy, the Porsche, is in fifth. Then Juan Manuel Lopez, the white Ferrari, fourth eight in sixth of the law, of course. Prepared machine. Tandy already a three-time race winner this year in the Mantar Racing portion. With an eye towards the championship, they don't want to see the Aston Martin romping up the road ahead of them because they pretty much keep for coming into this weekend. And oh, this would be advantage to Malicelli and Barber. Th this is Tandy's best opening, isn't it? As they come into turn five as he draws alongside them as they come out of this technical section sprinting through some of these slow cars, he takes the place. Oh, that's brilliant from Nick Tandy. And that was at the chicane at turn six and seven. And Brosnitsky is going to lose another place to Juan Manuel Lopez into turn eight. Through he comes, and Nick Tandy, when well, he set that all up through turn five, he was so confident, drew alongside, and he's already pulled several car lengths away from the dueling Ferraris. Uh, Brosnitsky did a great job uh, keeping uh, Tandy behind us as long as he could, but clearly uh, Tandy has much more pace than, than the Ferrari, and uh, unfortunately not down the straight, so it's clear to see that Porsche is really lacking on straight line speed, uh, but uh, obviously through the twisty uh, turns of sector two, uh, he made his move into the chicane. Very good move, very clean. We see it again, and very fair driving as well from Brosnitsky. He didn't move across, he didn't try and defend when there was no hope. From another angle, up the inside. Well, Nick Tandy, that's a move he would have learnt in the School of Hard Knocks in Formula Ford. And he's carried all the way through his career. So we've got 17 minutes, 20 seconds left on the clock. Here's the race leader, Miguel Ramos, who is just 1.4 seconds ahead of the second place car, Federico Leo. Here he is, and that chase has been very swift from Leo. It's only taken him, Tommy, the best part of three laps to close down a 10 second advantage. Yes, I mean, you know, looking at the screen, two to three seconds a lap faster than Ramos. There's obviously uh, uh, Ramos was uh, there's no hope of him uh, keeping the uh, the lead of the race uh, at the moment. We'll see. He still has to get through. He has to get past cleanly. And uh, but you know, with uh, more than over 15 minutes still of racing to go, uh, clearly Leo has a lot more pace than Ramos at this stage. However. Miguel Ramos is some three to five kilometers an hour faster through the speed trap each and every lap. So it could be that Federico Leo could start to get very frustrated here because provided that Miguel Ramos is able to drive a wide car, able to drive cleanly and smoothly through the technical sections of the circuit, the Corvette should just have the straight line advantage over the Ferrari, which runs out very wide again over the curbs. 
on into turn 11. That means he can't challenge into turn 12. But we'll see just how anxious Pedro Calero is to make this move for lead the race very, very shortly as they come to the end of another lap and Ramos runs a little bit wide through turn 13. He's able to claim the late apex. And actually, if anybody, it's Leo who's all over the circuit, sliding that car, working it very, very hard, whereas Miguel Ramos, he obviously taught him well, Tommy, because he's he's driving very cleanly, very smoothly. He is, he's doing the best he can, uh, but uh, I think, again, it's only a matter of time before the Ferrari gets through, and this is where really the team comes into play as well. You know, the team should be telling exactly what you said. We can see on our screens that he is quicker, uh, uh, that the, uh, the Corvette has perhaps an advantage on the straight. What the team should be telling uh, Leo right now is that, listen, don't push too hard. Just keep your calm, drive smoothly. You've got more pace. Just pick your moment. Just pick your moment. And Federico Leo can have his moment very soon because slow through turn two was Miguel Ramos. But uh, again, this is the differential between those marks. We saw that with the Aston Martin as well, Tommy. The, the, the slow line through turn two really enables the, the cars with a, a greater top speed to then gain more momentum through three and on towards turn four and actually withstand that challenge. And it's, it's a really nice opportunity to see the different characteristics of the Ferrari and the Corvette as Leo draws alongside, but he can't squeeze through past Miguel Ramos. And well, Ramos was in this position at Paul Ricard back in July, leading the race, when unfortunately he tanked with Andrea Monterbini, and that's really what he doesn't want is to have contact with Federico Leo. Leo, though, lights a blaze in the Hungarian sunshine, chasing down Miguel Ramos. Well, he's done the chasing right on the tail of Miguel Ramos, trying to find a way through into the lead of the race. I have to say that from Ramos's point of view, he could rather do with this race being shortened by 15 minutes because he, the, the concentration, Tommy, you know, as a, a top driver, it's just immense to hold on to the lead in a situation like absolutely. this. Absolutely. You have to drive absolutely on the limit of your tyres and not making a mistake. And that's uh, easier said than done. These guys are now in the car for you know, a good uh, 15 minutes or so. It's starting to get hot. The tyres are not at their best. Uh, this is real pressure. Real pressure. And Ramos is doing a great job. And again, Leo needs to just bite his time and push where he can, find the right moment to overtake without more time. Leo has the race in his pocket if he plays it well. 30 laps completed by the race leader. Mega Ramos, Federico Leo on his tandem. What about Matteo Malicelli? He was two seconds faster than the leaders last time around. And all the while that Mega Ramos is able to withstand the challenge from Leo, it is going to bring Malicelli into this battle as well. Now, let's see if Ramos takes this very slow exit from turn two to then build up the speed into turn three. That's exactly what he does. And that will then enable the Corvette to pull couple of car lengths away from the Ferrari 458 into turn four, although maybe not quite as successful in doing that this time around. No, if, uh, uh, what uh, Leo uh, really could benefit from is a videotape of the Tandy move, because that is his moment, coming out of that corner into the chicane. He obviously did not get out of that corner well enough, so you're going to have to stay behind him. But in the infield of the Sector 2 is where the Ferrari crimes all over the Corvette. Look at that. And Ramos is just starting to move early to the inside of the corners. He's starting to take those defensive lines. And that actually plays into the hands of Federico Leo. That makes his job easy because it means that Miguel Ramos is going to be slower through the corners. And so Leo is on the tail of Ramos. And this is as close as Leo has been really at any stage in this chase. And Ramos again is slow through turn 11. So as they accelerate towards turn 12, are we going to see the Ferrari ducking out, looking to the inside? Yes, we do. But Ramos is very late on the brakes. And Leo can't quite squeeze through. Through, but now Ramos has got to be really crisp with his breaking point into turn 13. He hits the apex absolutely perfectly. Repeat for turn 14 and then try and pull away into turn one. Yeah, this time into the last turn, uh, Ramos looked a bit tight there into the last corner. So if uh, Leo, Leo can have a good run, of course, the Corvette has a straight line speed. And there it is, it shows again. Ramos doing a very good job, really keeping the uh, the Ferrari behind, playing a game of snooker, and it's working for him at this stage. It certainly is, although again, he takes that tight inside line into turn one, Tommy. Yes, but I, and once again, Ramos is placing the car exactly as he, as he should. He's not allowing uh, uh, for the cutback either. He's, uh, again, playing a very good game of snooker with his car, uh, but I still feel 11 minutes to go. Leo has a lot more pace, and he's uh, just uh, stuck behind him at the moment. Yeah, of course, he won the pit radio. A little bit of a conference about maybe which are the best instructions to give to Federico Leo. 
That's right. And again, what best tricks would be to just bite your time, but to find your moment. He now has followed Ramos for several laps. He knows where Ramos is weak, and he needs to find that, that weak point and make a move. All the while, the race clock ticks downwards. We've now got just over 11 minutes remaining in what is one of the closest finishes we've had this year. But again, a good run from Federico Leo. But the problem that Leo's got is the corners where he is so strong are not really overtaking opportunities then. Ramos is able just to build enough of an advantage into those passing areas. But I think turn 12, which they're about to arrive into at the end of this straight, is probably Leo's best opportunity. It's where Ramos is the most ragged coming onto this short straight. As a result, Ramos moves to the inside. He's going to make Leo do this the hard way around the outside, which he attempts to do. He draws alongside the Chevrolet Corvette, but is squeezed out over the curves. And Miguel Ramos holds on to the lead of the race. Oh, but he runs wide into turn 13. Can he close the door? They almost make contact, but Miguel Ramos still leads it from Federico Leo. They go side by side into the final turn. And Matteo Malicelli is about to join them to make it three cars fighting for the lead here in the International GT Open. We've got just 10 minutes remaining. Everybody here at the Hungaro ring is watching the monitors as this absolutely thrilling fight heads into the latter stage of the race. And it's another lap reeled off with Miguel Ramos in the lead of the race. This is great GT racing. And look at Maluccelli now coming up to those top two guys. He's going to have a, a something to say in this, in this battle very, very soon. And you will know as a racing driver, Tommy, but sometimes when you come into a battle like this, you're just carrying more speed. You're running, running your own race. You can sometimes just carve through this fight as if they're not there because you're just seeing it from a slightly different perspective. Absolutely. Balucelli is now looking ahead, seeing what's going on, and he's thinking, I could actually get from third to first here if these guys don't watch it. And uh, there's enough time for Balucelli to get involved in this. Well, this is turning into the race of the season from the GT Open so far. It's been a thrilling year of racing, but this is really something else. But now Leo's got the run. He tries to do a Nick Tandy up the inside into turn six and seven, but he can't do it. And that Corvette is a big, wide, meaty thing. And again, Ramos covers the inside line. He has done an astonishing job, Miguel Ramos, to keep the Ferrari behind him thus far. But now Malicelli is right in his tail. Now, what? Miguel Ramos wants here is Malicelli to start occupying Federico Leo. Leo has to take some defensive lines, and that drops him back slightly from that race leading Corvette. Absolutely. That will be absolutely what uh, what Ramos needs. Uh, whether he will get that or not, we'll see. I think uh, Leo is still menacing Ramos, and uh, uh, there's far too many laps now that Leo has spent behind the Corvette. And again, he had an awful lot more pace than Ramos um, when he got close to him. He needs to find a way through, because now Malocelli is right up his backside. He really is, and this is now about to be the end of the 33rd lap of the race, and Miguel Ramos has just been metronomic over the past few laps, so across the line, flash these three leaders. Now I'm going to see the Aston Martin, able to have a little bit of a run on the Ferrari into Turn 1. Malicelli considers a launch up the inside. We are maybe going to see a challenge for fourth position as Juan Manuel Lopez looks to the inside of Nick Tandy. So that fight continues with the Porsche Tandy just leading Lopez. Malicelli a full second faster than Leo. Wow. Now that's that space coming from the Aston and he's right up with them. Now to turn three they come and the Corvette, though Miguel Ramos still leads the way. The Aston Martin Mar Matteo Malicelli if you're Malicelli, surely into turn one is where you'd be looking to try and make that move on Federico Leo. And that really gives Leo the imperative to try and get through. Now as he challenges into turn five, he's going to try and set Miguel Ramos up maybe for turn six and seven. He's right on the tail of the Corvette, but no, to the inside line. Miguel Ramos sees that coming. That was telegraphed a little bit by Leo, but he tries to keep his foot in around the outside. Does Federico Leo in the Ferrari then looks to the inside into turn eight? No way through there. Next up is the right-hander at turn nine, but still holding on is Miguel Ramos with Malicelli closing in all the while. Now, that's very good from Leo. That's where he needs to focus on, turning, coming out of turn five with good speed. That's what Tandy did before and paid off. He needs to focus on that. There, of course, team getting ever more anxious on the pit wall as these three race leaders, the Corvette from the Ferrari, from the Aston Martin, just under seven minutes remaining here at the Hungaro ring. Lights ablaze from all of them. Now, are we going to see Malicelli getting a good run in the Aston Martin down the start of his straight this time? Maybe to challenge Federico Leo into turn one. I don't think he's quite close enough. So they come through. Another lap is completed by the race leader, Miguel Ramos. 
And this, if he's able to hold on, Tommy, would be the driver of Ramos's career. It has been, uh, even for a professional driver at the very, very top of their game, to hold on to this sort of pressure is astonishing. Yeah, absolutely. Great drive so far from Ramos. Clearly, uh, you know, having a car or whatever, you know, whatever the problem is, if he has any issues with the cockpit, we don't know. But uh, his car has less pace than, than Leo's car behind and, uh, and is able to keep him at bay. Now, only six minutes left in this race. Will he be able to keep him behind? Well, the fight for four between Nick Tandy and Manuel Lopez is circulating a second a lap faster than the race leaders. And they're only two seconds back from this as well. So we could now have five cars in the mix to decide who's actually going to win this race here at the Hungaro Ring. Because they are closing all the while on this leading squabble, which Nico Ramos is doing a very fine job of maintaining. And that time around, Federico Leo didn't even pressurized Ramos he was just sitting in behind him and now that could be tactical drone from there he could just be taking a lap a little bit more steadily not overworking the tires and saving himself for a bit of a push that could be an issue of course now coming to the end of the race these tires have done an awful lot of work now and obviously these guys are battling which you know effectively you have you slide the car a little bit more you take a little bit more out of the tires so but Leo really needs to focus on that turn five. That turn five is his best shot. Coming out of turn five well, will get, get him an inside line. In the I think that that tyre point you make, Tommy, really bears out for Matteo Malicelli. Having closed up with these leaders, he's not really making any inroads. Uh, in that last couple of car lengths, he needs to be as part of that fight. And again, Ramos holds on through turns 13 and 14. This is 35 now. Reeled off into the history books by Miguel Ramos. Savancio Frederico Leo drops by two tenths of a second, but really that's academic given how fine the margins between these three leaders are. Again, Ramos covers the inside line, snatching a break. Federico Leo has he run wide on the into the turn one? Not quite, and certainly not enough for Matteo Malicelli to be able to take any sort of advantage. So the three of them hit the brakes again through looping turn two. Charging out of turn three, uh, and Leo is just slipping back from Ramos slightly. Yes, I mean, what's happening now uh, also with Ramos is that this is really playing to him. He's psychologically, he's thinking, I'm actually holding these guys back, and this is giving him more confidence, and he's going to maintain that defensive all the way to the end. Now, the Aston, of course, uh, had some very good laps and closed up on the front, uh, two, two leading cars, but as a front engine car, very heavy on the left front tyre, and as it gets behind the car in front, it loses a bit of downforce at the front, and it starts to hurt the tyre again with a bit of sliding. So the Aston perhaps now, oh, and we see contact now. Is that in the GTS? It is. Oh. It's Michael Dallastella who has done a fair amount of damage to that car, unfortunately, coming into contact with Alan Kalari, and that is not going to please the Kessel team because they're teammates. Uh, I can see water coming out of the radiators there, so maybe uh, that could be a, a, a DNF. Oh, and Leo tries around the outside in to turn 12. Is that he's pushed out again very wide over the grass creek, and that was a super run he had on Ramos, but Ramos assertive when he needed to be in defence. He kept the inside line, he kept his racing line, and Federico Leo is trying every which way. This is now closing up enormously with Nick Tandy bringing himself into the party as we go into what will be the penultimate lap of the race now, just three minutes left on the clock. And with a lap time in the one minute 50 second bracket, we're into the penultimate lap, and we've seen the challenge from Malicelli. He almost makes contact with Leo as they come into turn one. And Malicelli, is he going to squeeze through on the inside? He breaks very, very deep into the corner. Leo gives him racing room, but I think Federico Leo will hold on in second position. He does just that, but Malicelli asks you all the questions for Miguel Ramos. That is an early Christmas present because his advantage grows to about four car lengths. And that was so tight as Malicelli pulled out from the slipstream. Well, that's exactly what Ramos needed. Just the two fighting behind him so he can pull away and get just a little bit of, you know, of a uh, gap. Concentrate on the road ahead. Now, Ramos, once again, looking strong. I mean, t five, five, six laps ago, you thought that Leo would have come through quite quickly, but uh, great drive by Ramos. Here we see Federico Leo's attempted move around the outside of Miguel Ramos. Ramos just stuck to his guns and all... Oh, how close was that to being a very, very expensive moment for Matteo Malicelli, who has now just dropped back from Federico Leo and has got kicked Tandy, although his tail so Tandy and the Manthai Porsche team could yet get a podium from this race there on the tail of the Aston Martin. Juan Manuel Lopez is still in the mix, so we now 
have as we move in to the final lap in the third of the race two distinct battles the one for first and second then the fight for third fourth and fifth and so the two championship protagonists fighting over third position and this is going to be a very very tight battle over the part of that because the tires on the aston martin are beyond second hand that car looks very uncomfortable for malicelli yes here we go this is this is the last lap of the race. This is the last chance for Leo to do anything about the end of this race. Is he close enough? I don't think so. He's not, is he? He's a long way back into turn one. Nick Tandy is the man most likely to, on this final lap, I think, jump up onto the podium because Matteo Malicelli has been really struggling through the mid-speed corners, whereas Nick Tandy just seems to have something in reserve. So Miguel Ramos, after what has been a formidable defense, will he be able to hold on for this final tour of the Hungara ring circuit 4.3 kilometers ahead of them they've already covered the first of those kilometers and what about the remaining 3.4 through fourth turn we've got wave jello flags I suspect that's probably for Michael Dallas Della no it's not it's a car that's come to rest in the gravel trap we'll pick up who that is shortly I thought that was the BMW is it for GTS I could be wrong but I thought that was uh, the uh, Schubert car it did look suspicious like Daniel Roos didn't it in the Schubert BMW so out of six and seven Mega Ramos has still got that advantage and Nick Tandy draws alongside Malicelli into turn eight and he tries to squeeze through in the Porsche and he does that Malicelli runs wide Juan Manuel Lopez now takes his turn to try and force his way up into third position what a move from Nick Tandy he climbs into third on the final lap Federico Lev is challenging as well, Mingo Ramos to lead. We don't know where to look as into turn 12 come the race leaders. And Leo's going to launch one up the inside, but no, Mingo Ramos has got enough in his pocket. Nick Tandy is also able to hold on from Juan Manuel Lopez as the race leader, Mingo Ramos, turns into the penultimate corner. He leads from Federico Leo out of turn 13 into turn 14, the last corner of what has been a stunning race here at the Hungaro ring and still the podium positions are to be decided as accelerating to the jack of flag oh what a win that's been from Miguel Ramos and Rafael Giamaria second place to Federico Leo and Nick Tandy and Marco Holzer claim third with Juan Manuel Lopez and Andrea Montermini in fourth Matteo Malicelli and Alvaro Barber in fifth and then Philip Petter and Michael Brosnitsky claim sixth and that was absolutely fantastic. What an incredible race. I mean, coming right to the end, uh, this is credit to uh, Jesus Pereira and his uh, formula of GT racing. It's just a great, great racing. You have uh, three different manufacturers in the top three. What a great move by Nick Tandy on the last lap. It was, I mean, Nick Tandy through the course of that race, he he was the, the driver who did the overtaking. He, he made some stunning moves. Uh, Federico Leo, is he giving the thumbs up or, or a shaking fist there to Miguel Ramos? Ramos did nothing wrong. That was very fair driving. Absolutely not. That was very, very good driving. Very good driving by Ramos. And Leo obviously frustrated that he couldn't get through. Uh, but, uh, you know, Ramos showed all his experience over the years. And yes, he's not a professional driver, but he's a very, very competent GT driver. That, that was just a, a brilliant drive. You cannot overstate how difficult it is in this heat to maintain that sort of concentration under that pressure for, for Miguel Ramos for the best part of 25 minutes with Federico Leo all over his tail. Now in the championship, well, it brings things ever closer. Nick Tandy and Marco Holzer and the Manthai squad, they will be jubilant over third position as we take another look at this Nick Tandy move on Matteo Malicelli. And Nick Tandy squeezing up the inside and again, all credit to Malicelli, he didn't turn across him, they didn't make contact, it, it was all very clean, it, it was a, a spin as well in the late stages, unfortunately around for Massimo Mantovani, where in the GTS class, we haven't really, and it was the BMW that uh, came to a smoky hall, in the GTS class, it was Andrea Rizzoli and Stefano Pizzari who won the class. Oh, Second place was Mapelli and Arch Hamilton. Third place, Matteo Bretta and Marcello Puglisi. And there is an overjoyed Raffaele Giamaria. And, well, we've been talking about what a fine job Giamaria did, but uh, what Ramos did, but Giamaria in the first half of the race as well. So here is a look at the final results with Miguel Ramos and Raffaele Giamaria winning it by seven tenths of a second from Federico Leo and Jimmy Bruni. Third place was Marco Holzer and Nick Tandy. Fourth place, Andrea Montermini. 
and Juan Manuel Lopez, fifth place, Alvaro, Barbara, Matteo Malicelli, those five cars have given us quite a show. Winning the GTS class then, Stefano Pizzari and Andrea Rizzoli, they were seventh overall. Second in the class, and that was Marco Mapelli, Archie Hamilton, they were tenth overall, and then third in the GTS class, Forza Lansport as well, Matteo Beretta and Marcello Puglisi, the fastest lap was set by Miguel Ramos and Rafael Giamaria, and that was set by Giamaria in the earlier stages of the race. And, well, Tommy, as we take a quick check of the Drivers' Championship, how tight is this at the top? So it's Holzer and Tandy who lead the way by just three points from Leo and Bruni in the air, of course, Ferrari, and then a further three points back Malicelli and Barber and the handshakes <laughs> for the, the Corvette team will be going on long into the night because their drivers did a fine job today. Yeah, I'm trying to stress how, uh, how impressed I am with, uh, with Hamas' performance uh, today. It's uh, a fantastic, mature and uh, controlled performance in the very difficult uh, conditions. And uh, look at him, he probably can't believe it himself. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And that was very nice, Federico Leo, straight in with the handshake to, to say well done because that, that was uh, a very impressive I'm delight as well I'm in GTS class well. for all to Orlando Sport. They've got both their cars home on the podium. Federico Ramos, where you can see ju just the, the exertion behind the cockpit coming into the last Hermes. And this, I suspect, is going to be one of the most jubilant podiums we've had of the year as the GTS class winner. Andrea Rizzoli and Stefano Pizzari Rizzoli, it was who took the car over the, the line, comes to a halt in Park Ferme. And well, Tommy, if anybody ever asks you what is GT racing all about, surely this race was it. Multi March, you had the Aston Martin, the Ferrari, the Porsche, the race winning Chevrolet Corvette, wheel to wheel for the best part of half an hour. Oh, without a doubt, I've watched a few GT races uh, earlier this year in different championships, and uh, quite frankly, this is the best GT race I've seen in many, many years. Uh, clearly, again, Jesus, Jesus Pareja has a great formula where you have uh, different manufacturers fighting to the very end. I think only three seconds covered with the top five cars uh, that crossed the line today. Uh, and exciting racing. I mean, it uh, makes our job here in the commentary box very easy. It, it really does, because that, that was just absolutely fantastic. And what a way for the 99th race for the International GT Open to come to an end. Join us tomorrow. We will be, as ever, live on our web stream, www.live.gtopen.net, where we will have the 100th race from, from the International GT Open. And that race gets underway tomorrow at 1 o'clock local time here in Hungary as we take a look at the highlights from the race. And, well, it was a very lively race from the outset as Elvaro Barber streaked in the early lead by Jimmy Bruni kept his nerve, as did Rafael Giamaria. And as they worked through the early stages, it was Bruni and Giamaria who stretched their head of the field as further back. Cesar Ramos making a superb debut in the National GT Open, going wheel to wheel with Patrick Pile, eventually the Frenchman prevailing further back. There were a couple of adventures, Miguel Amaral having a quick spin through the first corner as the Maserati showed very strongly in the hands of Alessandro Pier Guidi so unfortunately being a late race retirement as he battled with Cesar Ramos and Michele Rugolo. Well the pit window then turned the race in its head as Miguel Angel de Castro encountered more problems in the drive X Porsche so was Jim Maria who blinked first in that fight for lead. He pitted in, turned over to Miguel Ramos, but when the cars came out, they were very closely bunched. Matteo Malicelli initially was mounting the move. He made this fighting pass on Nick Tandy. Tandy having withstood the pressure as long as he could. Jimmy Bruni pitting at the very, very tail end of the pit window to hand over to Federico Leo. Michael Brosnitsky benefited as well. He was up into third position after the pit stops are shaking themselves out. It was Miguel Ramos who came out in the lead with then Leo in second. And Malicelli climbing up into third. Michael Dallastella and Alan Colari unfortunately making contact here. Then on the last lap, Nick Tandy to the inside of Malicelli into third position. So Tandy claiming a very fine third, but Miguel Ramos after half an hour of pressure from Federico Leo came through. Absolutely 
fantastic victory for the Corvette team. Really, really fine performance oh, from Miguel Ramos and the co-pilot Raffaele Giamaria. really uh, doing great jobs. Um, Leo will be obviously disappointed I think, with this, this result, but you know, he needs to learn from this and gather his thoughts and uh, go tomorrow in fighting mood. Well, Nick Tandy, some very certified taking. I think we also shouldn't forget Rafael Giamaria because in the first half of the race, staying with Jimmy Bruni, who was running at such a pace, were, were, was really a fine form. And it set Mirgo Ramos up with the best possible opportunity to come through and take the victory. But even so, completely, completely agree with you that Ramos, under that sort of pressure for that long to, to hold on and withstand the challenge, was was a drive that he will cherish for a long, long time. Yeah, it's a great opening team by Jim Maria, without doubt. And, um, but yeah, just a great performance from the whole team altogether. And uh, I think Bruni as well did a great job uh, at the beginning. Uh, great uh, assertion to the first corner, and making sure that nobody was going to take the lead and they pulled away quite cleanly. Again, you would expect that from Bruni, but uh, you know, to do it consistently over and over again is uh, the mark of a true professional. And uh, uh, yeah, some, some really good moments from the race. I think uh, I can't wait again to see the uh, race tour. Well, we're about to get the podium for the, the GTS cars underway, which also gave us plenty of entertainment and plenty of drama. And the uh, last beat claimed by Andrea Rizzoli and Stefano Pizzari, they stayed out of trouble. First up, third place on the GTS class podium, Matteo Bretto and Marcello Pavlisi, the Auto Orlando Sport Porsche team. Second place, not the Auto Orlando team, cars Archie Hamilton and Marco Capelli. Archie, pretty clear to hear there. He is very, very happy with that. And then, of course, our class winners, Rizzoli. Sorry. Drivers then celebrating on the top of the podium as the trophies are presented here in glorious sunshine at the Hungaro ring. It's been bathed in sunlight all week and the drivers thoroughly enjoy many of them. It's their first opportunity to race here at the Hungaro ring. So as the trophies are presented and the champagne is about to fly here on the podium of the Hungaro ring, on behalf of Tommy Erdos and myself, Ben Evans, it's just about to say goodbye for today, but we very much look forward to you joining us tomorrow where we will have the 100th race for the International GT Open here on the Twists and Turns of the Hungaro ring. Uh, a kis kategória, a GTS kategória részen, a kis kategória, nem biztonosan kállig áll egyébként. Ha ki nem akart annyira uh, locsolgatni, inkább elhozta a pesgőt, mától berettem el itt, ha látunk, kicsit